Did a famous aviator predict the bombing of Pearl Harbor 17 years before it happened? The internet says it's true. Welcome back to The Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds like I made it up, but it's really true, and it's part of the WCBE podcast experience. Hey, my name's Michael Kent, that's me, and this is episode 200, which feels like a milestone of sorts for 200 weeks. 200 weeks we've kept the show going, and that's all due to you tuning in every week. If you didn't listen, I would have stopped this a long time ago, so uh, thank you so much for that. Also, thank you so much for all the ratings and reviews that you have uh, brought in this week. Listener CYN.HO. I'm saying it that way because otherwise it just looks like I'm calling someone named Cindy a ho. Uh, says, awesome podcast, super entertaining. Uh, let's see. E Lady says, such a fun podcast that always teaches me something new about history. Easy to listen to while on the go. Always something new and entertaining. Thank you so much, E Lady. And then uh, KM Parkey says, really, really good, which I, I really appreciate. I think that's Kevin, who actually has a pretty cool newsletter. Uh, this is a, a weekly newsletter about how decision-making science can help you become a happier and more effective educator. So this is for teachers. It's called Teachers Decide. So go to teachersdecide.com to sign up for that. If you're a teacher who wants to, you know, be a better teacher, which, you know, if you're a teacher, why wouldn't you want to be a better teacher? If you don't want to be a better teacher, then I declare you a crappy teacher. How about that? Also, welcome to Tiffany and Bruce, our newest Patreon members. They will be getting stickers in the mail. By the way, one of our tizzlers, Jim, sent me a photo he took in a meeting at work of one of our stickers in the wild on someone's water bottle. That's pretty cool. That's crazy. Uh, if you want your own show sticker, you can get them where you join the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's the best way to support me. I am once again asking for your financial support. Don't forget to pick up your show t-shirt. You can get those on our website. That's the internet says it's true.com. I can personally testify, by the way, it's a quality t-shirt. I wear mine all the time. It's super soft, holds up well. Uh, not only that, it's a great conversation starter. And now that you've been listening to the show, you have a million things you can talk about with strangers, which is kind of the point. Uh, this week's topic was discovered when my brother and his daughter and I took our dad to the National Air and Space Museum in Dayton, Ohio, for his birthday recently. So one of the displays there blew our minds, and somehow we'd missed it in all our years visiting the museum. My dad's been going to this museum since he was a kid. I've been going since I was a kid, and we've never seen this display until now. It's all about the famous aviator Billy Mitchell. Let's start by telling you a little bit about who he was. <clears throat> Let's get on with it. If you ever fly through the Milwaukee airport, it's a tiny little airport, but there are two things there that are really great. One of them is the Renaissance Bookstore, which is it's a used bookstore that's just a lot of fun to go through. The other is an entire museum dedicated to hometown hero Billy Mitchell. So let's learn a little bit about this amazing aviator. Billy Mitchell is often considered the father of the United States Air Force. That's because he was the first one to argue that it would be possible to create bombers that could fly over and attack battleships from the air. Mitchell was born in 1879 in Nice, France, while his American parents were on vacation. His father was a wealthy Wisconsin senator who had served in the Civil War. His grandfather had established a railroad and bank in Milwaukee, so he was born into wealth. Mitchell went to Racine College and Columbian University, that was the original name of George Washington University, by the way, but dropped out to fight in the Spanish-American War. He fought for General MacArthur. This was Arthur MacArthur, the father of the famous General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War in 1899, and eventually joined the U.S. Army Signal Corps, which was the group that handled the Army's communications and information systems. In 1901, he was in Alaska, helping to lay telegraph lines through the wilderness and experienced Otto Lilienthal's experiments with gliders. In 1908, he had watched Orville Wright fly his 1908 flyer in Virginia. Wright had spent the week flying his aircraft daily and showing it off to the military at Fort Myer. And these were Mitchell's first experiences with aviation. He became particularly interested in the use of aircraft to fight wars. When he was eventually promoted to serve on the general staff of the Signal Corps, he was the natural choice to head up the new aviation section of the Army Signal Corps. He had been the one talking nonstop about how future wars would be fought using aircraft. This was around 1913, and by 1916, at the age of 38, 
he took private flying lessons and became an aviator himself, just before the United States entered into World War I. Until the First World War, the United States military had only used aircraft for reconnaissance, mostly through the use of balloons, but then with the 1909 Wright A Flyer. In France, Mitchell studied the production of aircraft for the use in military. He met with Royal Air Force Commander Sir Hugh Trenchard, who was also calling for the use of offensive military aircraft at the time. In 1918, Billy Mitchell had been promoted to Brigadier General, and in the Battle of St. Michiel, Mitchell conducted aerial attack campaigns that wreaked havoc on German forces. He spent the war and the next few years arguing that the Air Force should be its own dependent armed service separate from the Army and could be used to bomb enemy naval forces. In 1921, he started lobbying to the military that he could use a Martin MB-2 bomber to sink battleships. So he arranged for a demonstration. They had captured this German battleship, and he had it moored in place. He gathered a bunch of bigwigs like the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy, and he showed them once and for all that he could bomb the ship, which he did successfully. And while the tests showed how effective aerial bombing could be, the military, particularly the Navy, did not like Mitchell's heavy-handed tactics and criticisms of the armed forces. See, Mitchell was saying that they weren't doing enough to promote this new sort of warfare. There's a lot to cover in Billy Mitchell's military career, so much that there's no way I could cover it all here. The important part of the story happened in 1923, just after his bombing demonstration. Mitchell traveled to the Far East on an inspection tour, and it was that tour where he really saw the destructive threat of air superiority. In his report submitted to his commanding officers after the trip, he warned that Japan was dead set on expansionism and would one day attack the United States through the air. We'll talk about his prophetic warning after a quick break. I'm John DeSando, host of Back Talk. This podcast is an extension of the long-running, award-winning movie review show, It's Movie Time. Back Talk features additional content and banter with guests about new movies. If you want more insight and information about what's playing now in theaters and online, find Back Talk at the WCBE podcast experience on wcbe.org. You'll be happy you did. We're living through the most dynamic time in human history, and what we do as leaders matter. We are the ones that create the leverage to shift directions of our companies, our nonprofits, and our communities. As a leader or an emerging leader, please join me for a dynamic conversation with top thought leaders, academics, and executives to learn more about how to elevate your leadership. I'm Maureen Metcalf. Join us at the WCBE podcast experience at wcbe.org. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. When Billy Mitchell returned from the Pacific in 1924, he submitted a 328-page manuscript and ended up getting hidden by the military and eventually lost in the files of the War Department for decades. But when it was rediscovered, people who read it were amazed at what they saw. The report detailed what Mitchell thought would happen in the future. Now, keep in mind, this was 1924. He said Japan would attack Hawaii as part of their expansionist plans, and they would focus that attack 
on Oahu. These are his exact words as written in the report. Quote, there is no adequate defense against air attack except an air force. This can be supplemented by auxiliaries on the ground, such as cannon, machine guns, and balloon barrages. But without air power, these arrangements act only to give a false sense of security, such as the ostrich must feel when he hides his head in the sand. He continued, Attack will be launched as follows. Bombardment attack to be made on Ford's Island at 7.30 a.m. Attack to be made on Clark Field at 10.40 a.m. End quote. Now, Ford's Island is the island where Pearl Harbor is in Oahu. Clark Field is in the Philippines. The details in the report were staggering. He went into great minutia on what forces Japan would have, the time it would take to reach their target, the defense of the Hawaiian Islands, and more. There weren't aircraft carriers when he wrote this, so he was sort of just making up this idea of how they would get there, and he goes into detail on like exactly how long it would take them to get there. The military did not take it well, by the way. They saw it as just more criticism and insubordination. And that was just one of the reasons he was court-martialed in 1925, an act that General Douglas MacArthur described as, quote, one of the most distasteful orders I ever received. The blimp Shenandoah had crashed in 1925. That killed 14 people. And then three different seaplanes had crashed, killing their pilots. And after these events, Mitchell had written a statement blaming senior military leaders. So they obviously saw this as like a sort of mutiny and President Coolidge himself ordered this court-martial. They ended up finding him guilty and suspended him from active duty while reducing his pay by half for five years. He resigned the following year, and he spent the rest of his life preaching about air power. In 1936, Billy Mitchell died from heart disease at the young age of 56. This was five years before the unthinkable would happen in Hawaii. It was, of course, unthinkable to everyone who wasn't named Billy Mitchell. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Remember, his prediction said Pearl Harbor would be attacked at 7.30 a.m. and the Philippines would be attacked at 10.40 a.m. On December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked by air by the Japanese starting at 7.48 a.m. They also attacked Clark Field in the Philippines. His prediction on that attack was only off by about an hour. Of course, Mitchell never lived to see his prediction come true. He never lived to see the Air Force become its own entity. He never lived to see the American military's air superiority. All of these things he was right about and died before they ever happened. He's been given his due respect since then. He's the only person to have a military aircraft named after him. He's widely regarded as the father of the American Air Force. The internet says it's true. It's time for Yap Yap with me and a friend. Today I am calling comedian Jay Black. Jay is an author, a comedian, a screenwriter, a producer, and he's currently joining me from a cruise ship. You're on a cruise line. Where are you this week? Uh, I'm, you know, here's the thing. I don't get off the cruise ships. I, I just, I don't, I never leave. I just stay on here like some sort of weird at sea hermit. So we were at St. Thomas yesterday. Right now we're, you know, on the water. Tomorrow we're somewhere else. <laughs> St. Thomas is, I guess that's the Atlantic side of the Gulf of Mexico. I, I don't know. Um, like, but wherever that is, I'm near that. Now, did you get affected by Hurricane Debbie at all or Tropical Storm Debbie or whatever Debbie is these days? Just flying down. Okay. The, the ship itself was fine, but like I flew down on Sunday and uh, it was just one of those beautiful moments when you get to the, the Philadelphia airport. And you just see the line wrapping out into the street at 4 a.m. Uh, uh, you just sigh and you go, I could, I could have been a doctor. <laughs> I didn't have to do this. I could have been literally anything else. In but, Philly, uh, I have so many memories of being in like long TSA lines for Philly down that long hallway with the windows on either side where you just feel like you're not moving. TSA agents, we know you don't have a lot of power in your day to day. I, I know. The the sheer joy that you have at standing at the place where everybody thinks the line ends 
and you get to shout, this isn't where the line is, <laughs> the longer line. Like, just do some training where you don't look happy that you get to do that. That's all I want from you. <laughs> just a little sensitivity. A little sensitivity training. Yeah. So for my listeners, if you do hear Jay going in and out on the audio we're going to do our best to to work with him but i think it's pretty cool that we can do this while he's on a cruise ship um and and i love having jay on as a as a frequent guest so um first of all before we get to this week's quiz if you remember from a few weeks ago we've added this new segment where the guest comes up with an interesting fact to try to stump me and the whole idea is that you come up with something that i didn't know about and then i'll honestly answer whether or not i already knew about it or if i'm hearing about it for the first time um, I swear I'm not doing this just to mine stories for future episodes, but it is fun for me to hear. So what do you have? Do you have one for us this week? I do. And uh, I, I'm going to confess, I looked this up so that I had something good. Okay. Last time I had something really good, and it turned out to be not the, true. Last time was the green room. Yeah, last time we, we talked about the green room and the origin of the green room. What do you have this week? Do you know, and I'm going to pronounce it as best I can, if any geologists are listening, you you tell me if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Petrichor. Do you know what petrichor is? Petrichor. Ooh, P-E-T-R-A-C-H-O-R-E? I don't think there's an E at the end. I think it's... Okay. Is, is this the smell of wet pavement? It's the, not the smell of wet pavement. It's the smell of wet ground. But wet ground. Wet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think I did read this once upon a time. Tell us about Petrichor. So that is the smell of wet ground, and uh, it is apparently built into us to be able to smell Petrichor. Like, we, we have up to 0.4 parts per billion, which is better than a shark's ability to smell blood in the water. What? Things are not known for their sense of smell. But we are biologically adapted to smell petrichor because the idea is probably that, you know, we are so reliant on water. Uh, finding a place that is wet is, you know, pretty much inherent to our survival. So the idea is uh, that uh, petrichor is the smell after like a light rain and you go out and you really enjoy that smell. You are biologically built to smell and enjoy that smell. Holy crap. I did not know that. That's super interesting to me. Um, just the other day, it was raining, and I opened the car door to get out, and Allison says that the, the smell, the uh, what was petrichor that we were smelling, it was so strong to her at that moment that she couldn't stand it. It was like making her nauseous because the, str the smell was strong. For me, it's always a positive smell. Like, it's always, I want to smell more of that. But for her, so there must be some yeah. biological reason that this, that we can smell this, right? Like we're to seek out rain when we need water. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably, and you know, a lot of biological stories turn out to be just so stories where you sort of just like work it out from backwards. So again, I am not a, 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 a psych, you know, a bio, a bio uh, you know, evolutionary biologist, but I think the 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 thinking on it is that you know it's just this idea that rainfall is probably the most important thing. Like smelling water uh, is you know uh, camels have the same ability to smell that we do, petrichor, because they're always seeking out water in the desert. But uh, that's why we find it pleasant and why we're able to smell it. I love it. Thank you. That is a wonderful, wonderful. I need to name this segment. Uh, we'll call it "What Do You Know." That's what it's called. What do you know? Uh, and yeah. so. That's a great one. Thank you. Uh, I, I, can't count, I can't count that as having known it because I kind of was, I knew a little bit of, I, I think I recognized the word, but let's get into this week's story. For this first question, we're going to play for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you got to tell me a joke. If you get it right, I will tell you a joke. Here's your question. Billy Mitchell was a famous military aviator who predicted which one of these world events. Was it A, the Jack the Ripper slayings in London, B, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, or C, 9-11. What? So I, you cut out a little bit on the sure. first name. Give me the first name again. His name was Billy Mitchell. Billy he, Mitchell. Yeah, famous aviator? Yeah, famous military aviator. They call him uh, the like the father of the U.S. Air Force, even though the Air Force de okay. never existed during his life. But uh, he predicted one of these things. The Jack the Ripper slayings, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, or 9-11? Well, I would think that the prediction of the Jack the Ripper slayings, which happened before the invention of uh, air uh, air travel, 
would have that would have been less impressive. It said, you know what I think is going to happen 30 years ago is some guy's going to start killing people in London. Uh, if he's also the father of aviation, I can't imagine that he was around or at least uh you know in a spot where he could talk about 9 11 so i'm gonna go with more obvious answer that he predicted pearl harbor the answer is he predicted pearl harbor um and this uh this happened 17 years i believe before it happened he predicted this now he died five years before pearl harbor happened um and uh basically he had gone over to asia on a, an inspection inspecting military stuff and he was kind of seeing the writing on the wall that japan was into this expansionism stuff and that the only way that they could attack the u.s was through u.s held territories he said they're going to bomb japan and he got it so close he said they're going to bomb japan with airplanes um on ford island in oahu which is pearl harbor at 7 30 in the morning they bombed at like 7 48 or something and then they're going to go and they're going to bomb Clark Air Base in the Philippines at 1040. And I think he was off by like an hour on that one. So just a, yeah, really weird details. Um, and uh, yeah, crazy story. So you got it right. I owe you a joke. Uh, here's your joke. A Spirit Airlines plane was taxiing down the tarmac and the jetliner stops abruptly. It turned around and goes back to the gate. They sit there for an hour before the plane finally takes off. And there's this passenger in the back and the Passenger asks the flight attendant, what was the problem? And the flight attendant goes, well, the pilot was bothered by this noise that he heard in the engine. And it took us a while to find a new pilot. <laughs> lovely, lovely. It's a good by one. the way, the, the thing about predictions, I don't know if you saw this, because I, I spend, I'm on the boat, so all I'm doing is being on Twitter. Yeah. And somebody reposted a tweet that they had from 2018 that said, hey, sleeper ticket, Harris Waltz. No way. Um, yeah, it just said that they like the vibe of the two of them and they think they can make a, a good thing. And she retweeted it. I'm just looking at it going like, you know, we should like we should be like uh, Mr. Glass in Unbreakable, looking for these superpowers of yeah. people who can predict the future and like put them together on a team. Because you know, some people just have the ability to put together all this stuff subconsciously and, and sort of come up with a prediction. I love it. And Nate Silver has kind of been sucking lately. So let's just let's just bring him onto the five thirty eight team. We'll get uh, we'll get this whoever tweeted this going, and and I and I'm into it. I'm into yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. How are shows going so far? The shows have been going wonderfully, but I haven't seen my family in three weeks. Mike. Oof. Uh, yeah, they were in Europe. For two weeks while I, I had to be home, I flew out to do these uh, ships on a Sunday, and they came back on a Monday. So it's wow. going to be a month uh, total before I get to see him again. And, you know, you spend every minute with your family. You're like, oh, my God, I can't wait to leave them. And you leave, and they want to see them again. So it's <laughs> it's very hard being a man. This they is, they, honestly, yeah. you, they think there's a patriarchy, but it's so hard <laughs> to be a man. <laughs> it is. It's really. It's really difficult. Um, a month is a really long time to be away. Uh, it's, it's, in all seriousness, it's it's like the shows here have been wonderful. Uh, yeah. Of all the cruise ship shows I've done, these have been the absolute best. Oh, that's my great. God! Do I miss my family? I yeah. really do. Absolutely. Well, for the next question, Jay, we're going to play for your best airplane travel hack. I know that you fly just as I much, if not more, than I do. Um, so our story this week was about this aviator, Billy Mitchell which uh, one of these military aircraft was named after him. Okay, so I'll name three. These are all military uh, bombers. One of them was named after Billy Mitchell. Was it A, the North American B-25, B, the Martin B-26, or C, the Boeing B-17? And this is a tough one unless you're into, like, these are all World War II aircraft. Uh, unless you're into that, this is tough. So, so was, I am a huge fan of of planes. I am. Oh, um, cool. Because I, if there's a nerdy thing that would stop you from going on a date in high school, I was into that thing. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm I'm just going to guess the B-17 just because the Flying Fortress uh, was, was such an important part of World War II. And if he was the father of aviation, the B-17 well, would have been a very good thing to uh, – so normally I would at this point 
go into the part where I tell you whether you're right or wrong, but I do want to give you a little hint. Um, this is like the nickname of the plane, this guy's name. Um, they call it the oh, Mi- really? oh, the I didn't Mitchell. Know okay. Um, like so when I say it was named after him, this airplane is called the Mitchell. And being that the B seventeen is the flying fortress, which you used in your answer, um, it would that would make it the Mitchell Flying Fortress or the Flying Fortress Mitchell. So I just wanted to put that out there if you wanted to change your mind or stick with it. Yeah, I do want to change it. Thank you, Regis. You're, I you're do welcome. want to change my answer. <laughs> Let's uh let's go over the numbers on uh, the, 20 B25 uh so North American B25 or Martin B26. Mar- these are the manufacturers. Uh I'm going to go 25 cuz I like that number better than 22. <laughs> Great answer. All right, I got you into the right one there. That is the uh, North American B25 is the the B25 Mitchell. Um and this is uh an American medium bomber. It was introduced in 1941, named in honor of the Brigadier General William Billy Mitchell, a pioneer of U.S. military aviation. It is literally the only military aircraft named after uh, a person. All the other ones are, are given crazy. these other names. Um, the B-26 is the Marauder, I believe. As you said, the B-17 is the Flying Fortress, the most famous uh, bomber in World War II. The B-29 was the Super Fortress, which was the one that dropped our uh, atomic bombs. So, yeah, man. Um, That's great. You know, I, I feel bad that it's it seems unfair that Billy Mitchell gets a plane named after him. But Pete Mitchell, who in 1986 defeated the Soviets in an air-to-air combat with MiGs, uh, not has anything named after him. He was the, uh, Tom Cruise's character in Top Gun. That's uh, <laughs> well, well, we can just I, say I that it's the... like, who is Pete Mitchell? I, every time you say Billy Mitchell, I think of Pete Mitchell. So that's that's uh, they didn't opinion. call it the Billy Mitchell. They called it the Mitchell. So it could really be either at this point. Um, you yeah, know, I'm wondering how many kids who are studying this in like, you know, 11th grade U.S. history are like, uh, yo, it's this name after Tom Cruise's character. He was so good. <laughs> All right. So here's a here's a airplane travel hack for you. Uh, this is for for anyone. Airplanes uh, are very, very dry atmospheres, uh, and if you fly a lot, you will get sick flying. And so my rule is every flight. So if I'm flying somewhere and have one connection with two airplanes, I drink one bottle of water for every flight. And that's whether it's one hour flight or 40 minutes or three hours, one bottle of water. And I use saline nasal spray as well to keep my sinuses good and hydrated. So... And so if I, if I could jump in there, it Please. is very dry, which is why I always bring meat I want to cure in my uh, carry-on. Say, say that again. You broke there. up just a little bit. That's why I always bring meat I want to cure in my <laughs> carry-on. I, <laughs> pull it in there and I, some... I make jerky. But <laughs> I, I'm with you. You get sick. I, you know, listen, I, I am vaccinated. I'm not crazy about COVID, but I still wear a mask on every flight yeah. because I stop getting sick after flying mm-hmm. when i started wearing a mask not just from covid but from everything i don't know about you but i like you know if i did a cruise the first few days i'm just laying in bed because i had caught something on the flight so i just like anything i can do to prevent illness yeah and the last three cruises i've i've done i've gotten sick on the cruise because the cruise cabins are also very dry um sea air plus right. you know so i actually bought a um a portable mist mister what's it called uh, a humidifier portable humidifier. humidifier yeah it's just a little thing that charges and then goes in your bottle of water you just stick it into a bottle of water and then it 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 puts mist up into the air for like five hours um i'll send you a link if you want one it's great it i've, I've been using it in like hotels and it's so good i think it makes yeah, a big send difference it over. That's yeah idea. yeah i should uh just put my amazon affiliate link on this podcast so everyone can go and get one do you did you yeah. prepare uh do you have an airplane travel hack so I have one specific Philadelphia because, you know, we, we were talking about that airport, which is uh, honestly, I don't know why it's an international airport. If you're coming from another country and the first airport you see is Philly, I, you're going to hate America. Sure. Um, it's one of the worst airports in the world. But uh, if you're flying out of Terminal D. Uh, a lot of times the line really is out the door. That TSA line is just overwhelming. You, here's my my hack you can get in through any of the terminals 
And CD, which is a short walk, it's literally like a five minute walk down the line, is almost always quicker than the one at D. That is so fantastic. If you are, yeah, if you are on D and you're like, you know, you got that TSA lady yelling at you, this is not the end of the line, and it looks like it's going to be an hour wait, take the chance, walk down to CD. It's almost always quicker. That's good. Good. Great advice. Um, okay. Question three, we're going to play for a sticker. We always play for these. They were printed by Sticker Mule, and so I'm giving them away as fast as I can because I will not be ordering from them anymore. Boo hiss, Sticker Mule. Boo, Boo hiss. hiss. Uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7, 1941, and the U.S.'s first response was the use of B-25 Mitchells from an aircraft carrier, which they are not made to leave from, uh, to bomb mainland Japan. If you saw the the movie Pearl Harbor, not a great movie, but they did cover this. This was known as Doolittle's Raid. Um, sure. When when did Doolittle's Raid? I call it Alec Baldwin's Raid. What's that? I call it Alec Baldwin's Raid. He oh, did he play Doolittle? Doolittle? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, when did it take place? Which one is, so remember, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor was December 7. When did Doolittle's Raid take place? April 18, 1942. December 9, 1941, or December 20, 1941? Oh, so I, I know this because I saw the movie Pearl Harbor in the theater. I haven't seen it since, but for whatever reason, it stuck with me. Really? They, they flew in 42, so it would have to have been the April one in 42. Uh, that's, I, that's, could do, uh, Alec Baldwin's raid was in 42. Alec Baldwin's raid was in 1942. You are correct. You are correct. So that's basically, think about, I mean, by today's standards, that seems so long because of our quick news cycle and stuff. Between getting bombed in the beginning of December and all the way in April was the first time we really struck back. That seems like such a long response time. But by those standards, yeah, probably not. nine minutes if it happened now. <laughs> exactly. It would be. I mean, think about you know, how quickly people call for retaliation when, when there's a, some sort of strike, you know, it's like the next day that they're like, why haven't we done anything yet? Why hasn't the president spoke about it yet? You know, it's crazy. Right. So, well, you know, it's interesting. It's you, you look at like that war and realize like that's Congress was still declaring war and we haven't <laughs> done that in quite some time, yeah. which is a little unsettling that like it's yeah. a unilateral decision seemingly made by the president. Yeah. So uh, I kind of like that they took their time and actually voted like you're supposed to in the Constitution. Yeah, get everyone on board. Yeah, especially because the war had been happening for so long and it was a big hot button topic or, you know, it was a big contentious debate as to whether or not U.S. should enter the war. And this was like the, OK, now we can finally do it. And then they still waited however many months to do it. So uh, question four, actually, you know, that was when we attacked. But when did we when was the. Um, FDR speech uh, declaring that a state of war has existed since this bombing. Um, let's look, because I played a little bit of it in the podcast. Let's see. That speech took place the next day. So there you go. December 8 gotcha. was, was when a war was officially declared. So that's, uh, that's more like what we're looking for. Question four. We're, we're playing this time for 7 million imaginary internet points. These can be redeemed. Oh my goodness! I need those. Yeah, these can be redeemed for so so much, um, and uh, you can just tell your your followers on Threads about them. I don't know what you do with seven million imaginary. Just bank them. The USS Arizona is probably the most famous ship to have been sunk during the attack on Pearl Harbor. This is the one that you can walk out and still see the top of it. You can still see, you know, this in the water. Um, which one of these facts is true of veterans who served on the ship? A, they are allowed to live on the campus of the Pearl Harbor base for free. B, they are allowed to be buried at sea with the ship. Or C, they are flown to Hawaii once a year free of cost. Oh, well, these are all very it, plausible. It feels like by one of those way. things where they probably do like a yearly. Let's bring them in and uh, chat with them. So I'm going to guess they're allowed to come to Hawaii once a year free of cost. That would be my guess. So this one blew me away. The answer, they're allowed to be buried at sea with the ship. Really? Uh, yeah, this is this is really cool, actually. Uh, so, I mean, as long as they've already died, it's very cool. Um, 
the, well, the, sure, yeah. the roughly 44 Arizona survivors have chosen this option. So 44 people who didn't die at Pearl Harbor but had served on the ship can uh, can do this. Now, other military survivors can choose to have their ashes scattered wherever their ship was located during the attacks as well. So it's not just the Arizona. Uh, the last person to be interred in the ship was 2019, fairly recently. I think that's wonderful for them that they're able to do that. Here's the thing, though, Mike, just on a, on a side note. Do you care what happens to your body after you die? Zero. Because I don't. Zero care. And and this yeah, is where I, my wife kids, and I are, are simpatico. Put me in the garden. Uh, no, it doesn't matter to me even a little bit. I, I'll be dead. Fire me out of a cannon into the ocean. Who cares? Yeah, I really don't need, um, I don't need a monument. I don't need a gravestone. I don't need an urn. I, I really, I, I will not care. And I, honestly, all that stuff's for, for the family anyway, right? Like, that's all for other people. But um, it is kind of cool to say, like, if you're, if you're the, the son or the daughter of the person that served on the Arizona, survived the attack, to, to be able to talk about that after they're gone and say they served on this ship and we go to Hawaii, you know, every three years and we go in, and visit. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of kind of a cool thing to do. Um, all right, so cool. you uh, will not be the recipient of 7 million imaginary internet points this time. I will retain those Very for upset. the next guest. Uh, but question five is for all the marbles. You've gone three for four so far, and if you get this one right, you're welcome back on the podcast. If you get it wrong, banned for life. Which, uh, sorry, here's your question. What is your prediction for 2025? Here's my prediction for 2025. We will be swearing in President Kamala Harris and Vice President Tim Waltz on January 20th. Okay. And uh, it, the the rest of the 2025 is going to be, and I this isn't just wishful hope casting. This is I, my true belief. We are going to see not just a slow unwinding of MAGA. We are going to see a very quick unwinding of MAGA, like when a vampire walks into the sun, like it's just going to turn into crumbly dust super fast. And I'm, I'm not just convinced of that. I'm like, I, I'm certain of it the same way Bill Mitchell was certain of Pearl Harbor happening <laughs> uh, 16 years hence. That is my Bill Mitchell prediction. I love it. That's a correct answer. That is right. We'll call, we'll call that one, uh, you know, correct. I, I can see it because think about how quickly QAnon went away. Uh, the whole QAnon thing yeah. just basically crumbled. Now, there are still hangers on, and there will be MAGA hangers on, but in terms of like a, a, a nationwide millions and millions of people movement, I agree. Um, but it'll be interesting to see nonetheless, no matter what happens. Next year is going to be a crazy, crazy year. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. You'll be on a ship Me somewhere. Too. I'll be in my basement. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. And Absolutely, man. Have a wonderful cruise, and uh, and I, I can't wait for you to be back with your family when you get done with this one. Me too. I, from your lips to the God shipping gear. <laughs> all right, man. We'll talk to you soon. That is all for this week. Thank you so much to Jay Black for being my guest, and thanks to you all for listening. Here's the voice of a child who is named William but hates to be called Billy. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it. See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Andrews, Dallas Red, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Templin, and the show's official emperor, Patreon. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips of the 